stand up for ten minutes instead. <laughs> oh, wait. Okay, I think we can get started. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to start with a couple of questions for, for everyone here so we can get warmed up together. I want you to raise your hand if you know who Timothy McVeigh is, if you've heard the name before. Yeah? Um, and secondly, for those of you who have a YouTube or a Facebook account, um, I want you to raise your hand if you've read either Facebook uh, community standards or YouTube's community standards. So the if you have read them. Okay. Nice. So this is, I'm going to confess, I have, until we started working on this project, I have not read them before. I didn't even know where they were on the website. Um, now, all right. I will explain, so the title of our report is, Who's Timothy McVeigh? Why Localization Matters and Social Media Platforms. Um, my colleague Julia will explain who Timothy McVeigh is shortly and why he's really important to our story here. But I want to highlight that not many of us have read either Facebook or YouTube's content moderation policies. And so I want you to think about why we haven't read these policies that are there to protect us, especially for minorities, especially for more vulnerable groups, um, and why it's so difficult to find them on the website. Um, Communicating content moderation policies is one of, if not the most basic aspect of transparency in content moderation, and platforms rely on end users, like us, to report harmful content. They use this information to train machine learning models, as well as to document and further track content across the site. So it's critical that these policies are communicated effectively to end users in the languages that they speak, because the quality of end users' understanding uh, of the terms of engagement impact the value chain uh, entirely. This is also made more difficult, of course, in Amharic, in Arabic, in Bengali, in Hindi, the four languages we fo we're focused on for this report, because there are not enough content moderators by far compared to, for example, some European languages, um, like in German, uh, per capita, it's, it's really disastrous how poorly supported um, what Meta calls minority languages, but are really global majority languages, when they want to free basics and other pro programs for the rest, um, for global majority, global south, however you want to, which term to use, to get them hooked on these products, but then don't provide access to the same platform as English speakers. Um, let's go to the next slide. I just want to share with you, so um, you'll see a link, a QR code, that uh, we put on some seats. It has a link to, to the full report, and there you can see in four different parts, uh, specifically to Amharic, um, to Bengali, to Hindi, and Arabic. Um, so the spoiler alert is that the quality of Facebook and YouTube's content moderation policies are far below standard that an average reader would, be, would consider acceptable, according to eight. Um, of our translators that went through each and every one of them, and we'll hear from one of them in a minute. Um, and this not only inhibits and often makes it impossible to read to readers in each of these languages to understand what the policies intend to communicate, but it also goes against the Santa Clara principles on transparency and accountability in content moderation. Um, these were written in 2018, of course, which both Meta and Google have endorsed, a set of principles that establish the baseline for transparency and due process in content moderation. And what I want to highlight here is that our findings show that both companies are going against Section 2, which stipulates that companies need to publish clear and precise rules that end users can easily understand. The same focus is not given to speakers of these languages. The findings also suggest that companies are going against Section 3, which stipulates users should have access to the rules, the policies, notice, appeal, and reporting mechanisms in these languages and dialects that they speak. I mean, one of the most egregious things was probably like looking, clicking on Zulu, and it just takes you to English. It's, it's not translated at all. Um, I want to emphasize here the bigger problem is that we're not offering the rule of law. We're not offering like we're not offering these platforms at all to be accessible for 
the majority of people in the world. Um, so it's no wonder that women are being kicked offline, that minorities are being pushed offline, that content moderators have conflicting issues that they want to tackle. Um, most users of Facebook and, and YouTube are not engaging with the platforms in English, so it's critical that we're able to understand the policies because this is the most basic aspect of content moderation that impacts all other processes. Um, Now, this shows that there's a, oops, let's go back. We might be missing a slide. We only have 30 minutes to go through the whole thing, and it's a, it's a 60 minute presentation, so. This shows that there's a significant gap in languages that are offered, so when, when Facebook and Free Basics went after most of the African continent, around South Asia, Southeast Asia, the platform, they wanted the platform to be used, but the content moderation and the policies that show people how to use the platform, how to, what it's for, how to talk to each other, what is allowed and what isn't, um, is vastly different. So, for example, with Facebook support, supports 112 languages, but only 76 are translated for content moderation. YouTube, 71, um, but only 52 are translated. Twitter, which um, supports 48, but only 36 are translated, content moderation is translated for. This used to be a lot worse two years ago. This is actually a step up. Um, Hindi and Arabic we chose because uh, Hindi is most, most widely spoken in, in India, obviously, has the largest user base on both Facebook and YouTube, and Arabic, um, we picked uh, as the most widely spoken in the MENA region, which has one of the largest per capita user bases across both platforms. In India, there are some 350 million monthly active users on Facebook and some 467 million monthly active users on YouTube, which makes it the single largest market. It also makes it kind of weird that Meta calls it a minority language, right? Um, in Egypt alone, there are approximately 46 million users uh, on the platforms. So just to explain also for Amharic and Bengali, through, um, we heard anecdotally that the translations for these languages were extremely poor, that machine translation was used, and the Bengali trans translation did not use the correct dialect um, in Bangladesh. So we wanted to assess what the quality was like, and what the impact of this is like, what, what's, what is the real world impact on this. Um, the report also discusses how translation impacts the entire value chain, this is really important, the entire value chain of content moderation and platform governance from end users' ability to report content to moderators' ability to detect and remove harmful content to machine learning and regulators' knowledge about what content is on the platform and what's allowed to be on the platform. So we wanted to understand how editorial decisions in the English source language is. Uh, is being used. So, for example, the user's reading level are reflected and understood in the translation. We also wanted to document whether and how the translations may use biased language to explain the policies in translation. Um, Julia, I'm going to hand this over to you for the second part. Do you want to use the same mic? Is this okay? So I get to do the fun part, which is talking about the key findings. Um, as Dragana mentioned, our research has found that translations of these content moderation policies across the four languages analyzed were below a quality standard that would be um, considered acceptable by average users. Most translations contained a number of quality issues, and this had obviously an impact on users' ability to understand the content. Um, for most of the languages that we looked at, the translation was actually so poor that users had to refer, and we have Atnaf here who can talk about this, um, users had to refer to the um, English source text 
to understand the policy in their own language. As a reminder, these policies are, uh, well, let me take a breath, sorry, are intended for users um, to understand what is acceptable and not acceptable on these platforms. So we can imagine that confusing and potentially misleading translations mean that it's impossible for non-English speaking users to make informed decisions about the content that they post, share and see online. And this has um, an impact on content moderation and platform governance more broadly. So we can only assume that providing uh, clear and usable translations of these policies uh, is a crucial task and should be considered a minimum standard. And we can look at the key findings one by one. Can you, oh, I actually have it here. Sorry. This one? Okay. So the first finding is that a lot of these policies had um, translations word by word instead of translating for meaning. Um, most of the texts showed regular and systematic mistranslations of terms that were not recognizable to users and speakers of those languages, even when translation of these terms may have been technically uh, accurate. One example of a technically accurate translation but semantically incoherent uh, was the Arabic translation of Facebook incitement of violence policy. In this policy, there was a mistranslated term, uh, call, which is a very important term in the policy, used to describe what calls to violence are, a call for violence. So meaning invoking and inciting violence. Now, the Arabic translation refers to these calls as phone calls, which obviously creates some confusion and the translated policy therefore erroneously states that phone calls invoking violence are prohibited rather than inciting violence online. Of course, this is a serious inaccuracy because first of all, it communicates that only phone calls instead of inciting violence more generally will be restricted online. And this implies that other calls to violence may be acceptable. The second point is also that in translating calls as phone calls, users might be misled to think that audio calls on Facebook may be monitored, which obviously contradict other policies on, um, which state that calls and chat on Facebook are end-to-end -end encrypted. The second, second finding uh, is the lack of contextualization. So key examples used across the policies are exclusively, exclusively US-centric. And there is no adaptation of these examples to the specific social, political, cultural, or religious context in which these policies are translated. Um, the initial question and the title of our talk, who is Timothy McVeigh, is in fact a reference to a comment that most of our reviewers had um, when looking at the policies. It comes in fact from I think it's Facebook policy on dangerous individuals, which states that supporting and praising dangerous individuals is prohibited, and then uses the example of Timothy McVeigh, who, as some of you know, um, is a, an American terrorist involved in the 1995 uh, Oklahoma City bombing. As one might expect, the example did not resonate with any of our reviewers and any speakers of those languages outside the US. So this type of lack of contextualization can lead users to not feel represented uh, and also can be potentially more dangerous. Um, if a policy is something I cannot relate to or I don't understand, how can I decide whether the policy applies to me and the content that I'm creating, sharing or viewing online? With consequences that I wish I could say we can only imagine, but I think we've actually seen in the real world. Uh, the third finding is that systematic errors and in grammar and punctuation were very, very common. And here we have a number of examples, and I'm not going to cover all of them. Um, focusing on the Amharic translation, 
there are repeatedly and consistently mixes of singular and plural form uh, and a lot of punctuation errors. And this results in text that doesn't reflect the original source text, but also which lacks clarity. I know that these can seem minor issues, uh, especially compared to the other ones discussed earlier. However, they do contribute to making these policies less readable and less clear and potentially lead to some misunderstanding for users. Uh, oh, I forgot to move the slides. Which one is this? This is fourth. One more. Okay, the fourth finding um, is that technical language was often, mis, uh, was often transliterated in these policies. Transliteration means that we change the words from one language or alphabet into another one using similar sounding letters or different characters. And this, in the process, the meaning might get completely lost. So if we do transliterate text, this requires the users to have a high understanding and knowledge of English. And we're talking about very technical terms here. Um, so in order for users to understand the words that are being transliterated, they would have to understand these words in English first, which for many of the users that we're looking at was not the case. So concept like scams or content or other examples that we have there, these words would require some explanation or contextualization. And omitting this explanation can lead to or create barriers for comprehension. Um, and then one more aspect that we looked at um, was bias that was, trans, uh, was reflected in the translation choices. As we know, language choices are not neutral and very often they do reflect existing power dynamics, favoring the privileged and more powerful groups at the detriment of more vulnerable and minority groups. And so this has a risk of exacerbating existing inequalities. The choices that we make around uh, regional or local dialects, the specific expressions that we decide to use or the specific words, they all can be and reflect a political choice and we should think about who is included and who is ex excluded by these choices and how these might have an impact on whether users decide to see these policies as applicable to them or not. Um, it is important to say, um, to mention that there are significant differences between the Facebook and YouTube community standards and guidelines in terms of how good the translations are, how inclusive and how usable for users. These, uh, this may also vary between one policy and the other within the same platform. I mentioned some of the differences here, but as, as said, we have a full report available. Uh, you can find it online. And if you're interested about this work more in general, you can talk to us um, anytime. And moving to almost the end. Um, in conclusion, as an organization that works on localization and making technology more accessible in minority languages, we know that translation and localization are difficult and complex. And based on this research and on our experience, we have some recommendations to improve the quality and usability of these policy translations. The first one um, is creating translation processes that serve and work with end users and we choose human-centered and participatory approaches to translate for meaning and in context so that users can understand the content that they're presented to and make better choices online, hopefully. This can look like involving and working closely with communities to translate and localize um, content, as well as getting regular and continuous feedback from the communities and from the users. A second recommendation is to be clear about the goal of a policy. Is the policy intended to protect users and their rights, or is it a policy to protect the platforms? And I think this can be reflected in how we translate those policies and the quality and the time and 
effort we've put into translating and localizing the content. Being also clear about the specific audience targeted, the language standard, the dialect choices, and what that implicitly means. And a third aspect, which is of course very important to us, is about context and localization. So closely working with end users and localizing examples using the policy so they are, that they are understandable and relevant to a specific audience. And this can look like hyper-localizing these policies and the examples, making sure that they speak to users and the communities that are um, potentially affected. And I think we might have some time for discussion. Uh, oops, this one's a lot louder. Um, um, well, maybe we can just do a quick intro. I realize we just jumped right into it. Um, so my name is Dragana. I'm Executive Director at Localization Lab. And I'm Julia, Program Manager at Localization Lab. Uh, hi, I'm Jamie Kokonya, Africa Campaigner at Access Now. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Atanafu Brani from CART. I'm from here. <laughs> And also a contributor with Localization Lab um, with Amharic for a long time now. I can't believe we didn't lead with that. <laughs> um, but we wanted to invite Jamie today and, and Atnaf also to talk about what is the impact of not making this accessible for people. Um, maybe the first question I'll hand over to you, Atnaf, since you work directly on it. And um, But more broadly, what were your impressions? and, and um, I want to talk about what kind of an impact does this have on on women and LGBT folks? What kind of an Im impact does it have on minorities um, when when we don't have an even um, an even plane on, on these platforms? Okay. You first, yes. <laughs> uh, first, I didn't know actually. Uh, the policies, uh, the, there were policies available in Amharic actually, so while reviewing those, uh, those uh, policies, uh, I am native Amharic speaker and I have to refer the English version to understand the Amharic version. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the thing is, I think the platform made that available to, to just check their, their, their list, that they are doing something in in Africa, yes, in Ethiopia, where conflict is uh, rampant because of the conversation uh, on, on social media platforms, so they are not that much uh, elaborated. There is no context uh, in the Amharic uh, uh, translation as well as there are examples that that we don't understand. For example, the Timothy guy. I don't even know the guy. Uh, I, I learned something uh, new while, while reviewing the translation. But in general, the, the, the policy doesn't help uh, the Amharic uh, speaker focus here, here uh, in Ethiopia. Um, so I think for us, something that we have seen and also been concerned about is that generally the platform's not investing in human content moderation in this region and the effect that that has on harm reduction for people at risk. So I'm from Kenya, for example, and we've had you know a tumultuous political history around elections. And so our National Commission of Integration came up with a hate speech lexicon that um, platforms could use to flag content. But weeks before our election, Global Voices did an experiment to test the Facebook's preparedness. And all of these advertisements with all of these hate speech terms flew right through. And if they're not 
taking those kinds of things into consideration, then it really puts people at risk because we've seen how a lot of incitement to violence, hate speech has proliferated around those really tumultuous political times in our country and the effect that that has in the short term, of course, with the elections and disinformation, but also in long term effects in terms of people at risk like women, girls, um, and also ethnic minorities in countries like ours. But something else that we have been concerned about is, you know, the impending and increasing online hate and violence against LGBTQ people in Africa. And in Ghana, for example, over the past year since um, the tabling of the anti-LGBTQ bill, there has been an increase in, in hate online against LGBTQ people. So if they're not able to access those kinds of policies to flag the content, then it really makes harm reduction difficult in the off online space. And that kind of harm is transferred to the offline as well. Um, and when I think of women as well, you know, I look at, for example, their non-consensual intimate imagery policies. So a term like that, yes, we know, for us, we know what it means in English, but if it's not accessible in other languages, then it's really difficult for victims or survivors who are affected by that to be able to flag that kind of content and to prevent it from being spread online. Um, yeah. Such a good point because in the report we have some specific examples in each of the languages, especially this part because it's so poorly translated about what images are allowed to be on there that it makes it very easy to uh, harass women. To um, it makes it very easy to to abuse people who um, for whom there there aren't easy like access to, to mechanisms, not just legal mechanisms, but policy mechanisms that would get people to say, here's the policies that says you can't put this image of me up here, you need to take it down. But as Atna pointed out, if it doesn't exist in your local language, uh, why would we expect people to just jump onto the English one? Just, yes, of course. And I think that even when these policies are in English and of good quality, they're not easy to navigate. I've oh, yeah. read them in English, I've read them in other languages that I speak, and sometimes I'm still unclear of what I should be doing online. And so I think thinking about the quality of translation is one step, but also thinking about how to make these policies really usable and accessible to people is another step that would help. So I mean, going off of that, just one final question. How these two enormous companies that are extremely wealthy, why are they using machine translation for content moderation and how do we expect my, my overarching question I guess better translations with contextualization the title came by the way because two of the translators I don't know if it was you Atna or somebody else but literally wrote as a comment saying who the hell is Timothy McVeigh um, but I thought it was both a provocative title but it was interesting that everything like that w was in here. So if transla better translations aren't enough, what is the overarching problem he issue here, I guess, is that who are these content moderations for? Who is the platform really for? And why is it that we can only push Facebook meta to do something better once civil society gets together to point issues out like this? Um, so this really s easy answer. Um, no, but I'd love to hear from both of you on, on where do you see this going? Because we kind of, we, and Julia goes into some, um, some specific examples, but th this is a symptom of a disease. And how do we tackle the bigger issue? Um, so I think tackling the bigger issue is looking at the fact that I think for a lot of civil society organizations that are working on this, we're looking more at the effects of what comes after platforms are dis disproportionately or like applying the content moderation policies. For example, like with the conflict in Ukraine, we saw a more proactive response from platforms than you'd see like in Tigray, in Myanmar, in other places that have had similar conflict. So I think looking at the fact that for example, in Africa, companies like Meta outsourcing their content moderation to third parties. And them being able to do that when they overwork, underpay these workers, they're not held accountable for it because now 
for example, like the current case with David Motwang, who's suing Facebook and the third party content moderator in Africa, Summer Source, Face Meta is distancing themselves and saying that this person is not our employee. He's an employee of Summer Source. But their policies apply not only to their workers, but to their um, consultant workers as well. So I think we really have to look at things at the root. When we say that we want them to not only rely on automated content moderation, we also have to look at how human content moderators are being treated already because how they are being treated and their working conditions impact the ways that they're able to flag these kinds of content, respond to their content. So if that's not being addressed, we'll keep dealing with the same things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, to talk about the content moderation, I think uh, Meta has now uh, moderated contents in, in three lo local Ethiopian languages, Amharic, Tigrinya, and Afan Romo. Uh, not only the conversation on Facebook polar polarized, it is the content moderators even itself that based in Kenya, Kenya they are so polarized and they allow contents that, that benefit their ethnic background. This has been always a problem. There, were, there, there was a content moderator whom I know who does part-time job as a news anchor for nationalist media who broke a news that that uh, that that say this this rebel groups uh, control this 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 and so they are not neutral at all and uh, have been raising these issues for folks who work at uh, Facebook. They are not that much, uh, frankly speaking, helpful and. Uh, it doesn't mean that they, have, they don't have presence here in, in Ethiopia. They tried to support civil society organizations, especially, I mean, they support our work uh, in, in media literacy work that we are doing here in Ethiopia. But uh, that's not enough. They, they need to scale up their, uh, their, their work, their moderation. Uh, at the same time, I, I, they need to give uh, priority for, for a country such as Ethiopia where uh, where there is civil war. I think after um, Myanmar issue, it, the Ethiopian case is a huge one and it's affecting everyone's life. That's exactly what, that's exactly what they said also, was that after Myanmar, we, we want to put in more effort. We don't want to be complicit in, in crimes again. But the same thing happened. Um, and if I can add just to that, perhaps listening to civil society and... Um, especially from vulnerable groups who, who are always on the end of abuse with lack of attention like this. And when also, th so thank you for coming. Um, we have some stickers and some pamphlets also on the back table here. If you want to get involved, um, we hope to do more work like this on other languages, um, especially if you have some funding. Um, but we work with we have 7,000 contributors that work on translating open source technologies, circumvention technologies, um, uh, resources. We're starting to do more research. Um, we're a grassroots organization, and we'd love to we'd love to work with you. So there's some information here. Thank you, everyone, for coming.